Welcome everyone to this webinar, What Comes Next? Leading and Learning in Unprecedented Times. I'm honored to be joined by my colleagues, uh, Weston Kieschnick, who's an associate partner, and Vanola Mason, who's a senior fellow here at the International Center for Leadership and Education. A few weeks back, you know, we, we were just putting our heads together and, you know, as we've been doing, pivoting to a lot of digital work, uh, assisting schools and districts with a whole breadth of uh, areas, you know, we said, hey, you know what, we're, we're seeing this, we're, we're putting this into practice, let's create a webinar, fast paced, 30 minutes to provide not just some information, but some strategies and as well as some means for follow-up for all of you as we go through. So uh, you will see uh, my colleagues, Weston and Vanola very soon. Uh, we have transition slides. I will tell you, and I'll remind you at the end, uh, you can get a PDF of the slide deck. Uh, we have that ready to go for you if you are interested. And we will hand that, oh, well, I hand it out. You will get that after the presentation. And again, it is being recorded. So let's get started. So as we think about, you know, the digital world and how things have really been disrupted, a lot of them have gone virtual and we've worked both synchronously and asynchronously. We encourage you to share your thoughts, your ideas, as well as questions or to just back channel during this webinar using the hashtag LeaderEd. It is very simple, very easy, and painless. So as we think about leadership that schools need, then my name is Eric Scheniger. I'm an associate partner. I'm a former principal, and I've now been with the International Center for six years. If you want my contact information, there I am on Twitter, or you can visit my website. So as we think about where we are, and we think about leading in these uncertain times, you know, listen, we never saw this coming. But as we think about the teacher leadership, the building leadership, the district leadership that we need, we have to be able to embrace vulnerability, demonstrate empathy, exhibit courage. You've got to be a great listener. One thing that's a hot spot when we think about leadership is health and safety first, not just for our students, but for teachers, for administrators, for support staff. The best leaders model the way. This is not about having all the answers, everyone. No one has all the answers. It's okay not to know. Admit, I don't know, and I need help. But by doing so, before that, ask questions and then find answers. Make sure you provide the support from your area, whether you're a teacher, administrator. Relentlessly communicate with your parents, with your kids. And you know what, everyone? Learn from the past. You know, COVID-19 has taught us that, you know, all kids learning the same way at the same time doesn't necessarily work. We saw things with remote learning that might not have been what we wanted. The whole idea here is everyone learn from the past. We are facing so many challenges from different fronts, but those challenges present opportunities to do things different and do things better. As we think about doing things better, health and safety, we need to engage everyone in the conversation and make sure in, in these uncertain times, what comes next, get everyone a part of the process. Listen to parents, to students, to teachers, to other support staff. Prioritize what we need to focus on, what you need to focus on, because engagement and listening don't really matter if we don't prioritize and don't come to a consensus as to what we need to do collectively to make sure schools are safe for all kids, for all teachers, all administrators, all support staff. And as we begin to think about reentry, this is not in an order of significance, everyone. My colleague, Vanola, she's gonna talk about SEL uh, later in this presentation, but we gotta focus on SEL. We gotta be ready for how we're gonna address and close learning gaps. We gotta focus on pedagogically sound blended learning, ensuring equity, flexible and innovative schedules that accommodate sex social distancing, looking at our budget, stretching our budget, thinking about professional learning to support all of this. So many districts are going one-to-one, -one, which is great, everyone, but one-to-one -one does not equate to learning. 
We need to make sure job embedded ongoing supports are in place and we have to actively engage the community. As we think about re-entry, we think about focus. Here's the thing, everyone. We can't prepare kids for something. We do not know what that something is. We need to prepare kids for anything. Something I talk extensively about uh, in the new edition of Digital Leadership and that preparing them for anything really fits into what we're seeing now. And how do we create a common vision, common language, common expectations? Keeping it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. We want to get our kids to think, ladies and gentlemen, and we want to empower our kids to apply their thinking in relevant and meaningful ways. That is how we future-proof education. That is how we create meaningful, lasting learning opportunities that are going to carry on with our kids. This is how we help ensure the success of all learners, working their way up on knowledge taxonomy, but thinking about how they're applying that thinking in relevant and meaningful ways, getting them to quad D, and thinking about the natural role of technology in all this. You know, it's not technology on one side, curriculum instruction assessment on the other. How are kids using technology in ways to do things they couldn't do without it? How does technology represent a fundamental improvement over what we've done in the past? Those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. It's not about an add-on. It, it's not about a digital pacifier. It's about learning, everybody. And with or without technology, we want to get our kids to learn. And as we think about learning, and we think about where we are, you know, many of us now are going through planning processes, I hope. And many schools, especially the one that my kids go to, are looking at a hybrid model. A hybrid model that's going to incorporate so many different elements. I will tell you this, just like with remote learning, there is not one right way to create a hybrid learning model. These are just some ideas on this screen for you, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we're still going to have face-to-face. We want to make sure we improve that so it's not all kids doing the same thing the same way at the same time. Blending sound instructional strategies with blended learning, which is what my colleague Weston's going to talk about in a few minutes. We want to personalize learning. Personalization is not about putting all kids on front of a device, having them do an adaptive learning tool where there's no discourse. Personalization is a shift from the what, what we teach, what's in the curriculum, what's on the test, to the who to emphasize ownership of learning. It focuses on high agency strategies such as voice, choice, path, pace, place. With blended learning, you know, how are the kids using blended to create a personalized experience? How are we grouping and regrouping kids based on data? What's the role of adaptive learning tools as a means to not only differentiate, but to get that data, to close those achievement gaps, to close those learning gaps, how will we incorporate and balance social distancing? How will we reorganize classrooms? How will we look at that balance between what kids are doing asynchronously at home and synchronously both at home and in school? Talked about health and safety. We also got to look at flexible scheduling, you know, because we might have restrictions on how many kids and adults can be in our buildings. And we're going to go back to remote learning. Listen, it's not that remote learning was a failure, everyone. We did the best. You did the best. You were asked to do the impossible and you rose to the occasion and you did it as teachers and administrators. Now the idea is how do we improve it? How do we make it better? And the key with that when we think about making it better is the support for teachers and administrators. When you think about where you are now and you think about where you want to be, you need to think about how will you get there? Yes, there's going to be district and school needs that are influenced by the federal government, the state government, but there's also your needs as teachers and administrators. Effective professional learning is a congruence, convergence of both. Research, especially from Linda Darling Hammond and the Wallace Group have said, the professional learning that gets results is job embedded and ongoing. And we now can do that in a hybrid model as well, both virtually and face to face. Advocate for what you need, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Weston Kieschnick.
Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, I appreciate you. Hello, everybody. My name is Weston Kieschnick. I'm an associate partner with ICLE, along with my colleagues, uh, Vanola and Eric. There's only one thing you need to know about me, and that is this. Uh, I love teaching, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what it takes to teach and survive and thrive, and I want to talk about lessons learned from teacher and school administrator in remote learning. I will say I was fortunate enough to be a, uh, a virtual hybrid and face-to-face -face teacher and also an administrator in a virtual and hybrid school. And here's some lessons that we learned along the way. Eric, Eric if you wouldn't mind uh, switching to the next slide. Uh, here's some lessons learned in remote learning. Uh, lesson number one, here it is, uh, education is not broken. Uh, go ahead and, and show the next quote. I'm sure some of you have heard this narrative out there. Uh, this is pre-pandemic, uh, that education is broken, our schools are broken, teaching is broken, and I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm done here and our schools are broken. Uh, I, wanna, I will continue to shout it from the rooftops that in the age of global pandemic, it was our nation's schools, it was educators that made sure, that made sure our children were fed physically, mentally, and emotionally. And so we have to stop looking at our schools with such a critical eye, and we've got to instead start looking at our schools and especially our teaching practices, those that we know work well with kids, and we have to wrap our arms around those and make sure they come with us in that true bold school mentality of blending old school wisdom and new school technologies we have to blend those old school wisdom, uh, things that are, uh, that are a part of our old school wisdom and take them with us on the path to really great blended learning, whatever it looks like, either virtual, hybrid, uh, or some sort of face-to-face. -face. Uh, so having said that, let's talk about lesson learned number two. Number one, education is not broken. Number two, communication is king. Uh, having said that, uh, a survey, let's talk about the communication challenges that we ran into in the era of remote learning. Do me a favor. A survey in the chat window right now, there was a survey done of more than 2,000 American adults, and they asked how many emails a person could reasonably respond to in a given day. Type into the chat window, what do you think is a reasonable number of emails that a person could respond to in a given day? Throw out a number. Uh, let's, see, let's see what you think. 100, 7, 20, uh, excellent, 50, thank you. Yeah, throw out a number. What do, what do you think is a reasonable number? Good, Eric, go ahead and reveal the number that these 2,000 people said. Uh, these 2,000 individuals said that 50, 50 was a reasonable number of emails that a person could respond to in a given day. Now, having said that, research was done in the era of pandemic. In the era of pandemic, people wanted to know the average number of emails U.S. teachers received throughout the course of the day, and guess what that number was? Go ahead and reveal, 121. So, talking about lessons learned in remote learning, we know that communication is king. We know that we have to stay in touch with our parents. And at the same time, what we also know to be true is that that communication is going to be really important. And we're gonna to have to modify our communication in such a way that, hey, you know what? Parents and uh, at-home caregivers have to have one communication platform and then make sure our children have another communication platform. As you can see from lesson number three, parents, at-home caregivers, they are the linchpin. We have to make sure to prioritize that communication that we have with them. Send them to, the, to your email. One of the biggest mistakes that teachers make in remote learning is blasting their email out to everyone. And what I'm here to tell you today is uh, our kids are not digital natives. They are digital natives in the sense that they've grown up with technology. They're not digital natives in the sense that they know how to use technology in productive work environments. Save your email for your parents and make sure to send your kids to your learning management system, to Padlet, to Google Slides, Mentimeet, or some other back channel that they can use to stay in touch with you. Uh, parents and at-home caregivers are the linchpin. Now, having said that, I want to remind us that O minus D equals S. When we think about parents and the role that parents play, education is at its best when it's a handshake agreement that occurs between parents and at-home caregivers and educators. And we agree that for six hours a day, either in virtual, hybrid, or face-to-face -face environments, we're gonna do this, and parents are gonna join us in that effort. Now, when we're talking about schooling from home, because what Eric said is accurate, we're gonna to have to go remote at some point. What we have to understand is that observation minus distraction equals success. Now, uh, having said that, let's talk about distractions. I would bet, I would argue, that if I asked everyone on this call, all 92 participants right now, to produce your cell phone in the next five seconds, I would argue, yes or no, that many of you would be able to do that. 
right? I'll tell you, I can do it. I'm one of the presenters and my phone is right here. So we have to acknowledge that distractions are everywhere. They are ubiquitous. Kids have distractions all around them right now. And we have to lean into our parents and at-home caregivers if learning does go remote, if learning is hybrid, to help us with those distractions and to help us with that observation piece because we know that that's what sets kids up for success. I will tell you that in my experience as an online teacher and administrator, I saw very, very few kids who were able to be successful with the absence of observation. Moving on. Number one, education is not broken. Number two, communication is king. Number three, parents and caregivers are the linchpin. linchpin. Uh, number four, we have an assessment addiction uh, and we need to talk about it. One of the things that we learned during the course of global pandemic when we went remote, one of the most common questions I got during the age of pandemic was how do we grade? How do we grade? How do we grade? And it needed to be, how do we teach and how do we build relationships? Guys, we can't continue as a system to throw assessment solutions at pedagogy problems. I'll say it one more time. We can't continue, especially in the area of remote and hybrid inst uh, instruction, to throw assessment solutions at pedagogy problems. We have to get really, really solid about the pedagogy and the instructional strategies that kids are going to need to be successful. With that in mind, let's take a look at some of those instructional strategies. I will tell you in some research I did uh, uh, for my next book that I will not publish, right? Your average teacher nationwide can name and describe with accuracy only about three instructional strategies. That's a problem, right? In that same research, I wanted to know how many digital tools, how many digital tools can your average teacher nationwide and describe with accuracy? And that number was six. Consider that your average child around the country is walking into a classroom where their teacher can name double the digital tools as they can instructional strategies. Guys, our children cannot succeed in classrooms where there is a tool surplus and a strategies deficit. They just can't. Imagine now that either in remote, hybrid, or face-to-face -face environments, kids were walking in and being exposed to the 11. I've done this work for you. These are the 11 top, most frequently used, highly effective strategies used in classrooms across the country. Now, what happens if we're remote? What happens if we're hybrid? The question becomes then, what is the experience for kids gonna be? One of the things that I'm encouraging all school leaders, district leaders, and classroom teachers to do right now is to make sure that if kids are with us face-to-face, -face, and if kids are with us in some sort of virtual synchronous or asynchronous environment, the experience they have in both of those places cannot be the same. If I walk into a classroom with my teacher, it can't be the same, here is my teacher's face, here are the slides and watch me talk through the slides as it is in a virtual environment. We have to make sure that in face-to-face -face environments, kids are experiencing jigsaws because we know a jigsaw has an effect size of 1.2 and problem solving teaching and peer tutoring and Socratic seminar and self-assessment, those things that are really, really difficult to do in a virtual environment, which we know they are, not everything can be done in a virtual environment. So those things that are difficult to do in a virtual environment have to show up face-to-face. Consequently, those things that are easy to show up in a face-to-face -face environment need to have a stronger positioning in our virtual synchronous and asynchronous learning spaces. And we have to ask ourselves how we can use digital tools to elevate instructional strategies to make them better, more effective, more efficient. How do we use Edpuzzle to uh, elevate interactive video and so on and so forth? And last but not least, right? Uh, remember, uh, the making of a master teacher is about, Eric, go ahead and click through till, till we get to the end. Uh, how do we make a master teacher? It's about great strategies, great tools, and great habits. Why? Strategies are how we create rigor for kids. Relevance is created by using relevant tools, the tools that our kids are going to need to work with in the, in the work environments that they will live and work in, and relationships show up in our day-to-day -day habits. Now the question for us is, how do we make those relationships so, show up, and how do we make them meaningful for kids? Well, the answer is simple. In my next book, Breaking Bold, which is out now, uh, here are the top 12 most frequently used, uh, best uh, 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 relationship habits being used by master teachers around the country. We don't have to speak vaguely and with ambiguity about relationships. We know what it takes to build great relationships, and it's these 12 habits right here, and they have to show up organically. They have to weave like an invisible thread that flows through everything that we do with kids in the midst of great strategies and great tools. These are the things that we do for all kids all the time. Now, Vanola is gonna talk about when we do thing, these things for all kids all the time, what happens when we still can't reach kids in a virtual environment or face-to-face. -face. Vanola.
You're right on time, Weston. Oh, you heard my buzzer, right? I heard you. <laughs> hey, guys, I'm Vanola Mason, a senior fellow with ICLE. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Weston, for getting this queued up this evening. And just like Weston said, um, th leveraging those relationships is so important. Um, and so I, before you guys actually take heed of the 12 habits that Weston shared, and we definitely want to make sure that we internalize and learn those habits, there are some things that we've been doing while we've been in quarantine that we need to unlearn, right? Yes. Um, you guys see it, all the binging that's been happening, and please don't tell me that I'm the only person who has spent a Saturday afternoon on my couch and watched two or three seasons of How to Get Away with Murder. Um, during this COVID-19 time with all the shutdowns, uh, school closings, you know, life as we know it has completely changed. The way we socialize has changed. The way we do business has changed. And most importantly, the way that we look at schools has changed. The way we do school has changed. And over the past few weeks, I have spent so, many, so much time on Zoom, on WebEx, with districts all across this country. And folks, I'm in Georgia. School starts in about two to three weeks, and there are still so many unanswered questions. Folks are still trying to decide if we're going to start school online, if we're going to start in person, if there will be some type of hybrid approach. So many unanswered questions. So many things for us to figure out. And the truth of the matter is, we will not know the true impact of this pandemic for many years to come. The only thing that we do know is that this pandemic has caused widespread trauma across our country, and especially for our students. And so in schools, we have to be prepared to address those challenges and address that trauma. And I know that we want to jump back into planning for reentry and focus on which standards we want to teach um, and what that curriculum is going to look like. But first, we have to address the social emotional wellness of our students and also the adults in the building. Now, in 1995, Kaiser and the CDC did a joint study, and they surveyed thousands of adults. What they found in that study is that two-thirds of those adults reported that they experienced at least one of these ACEs, or adverse childhood experiences. And there were about 20% of those adults who said that they experienced at least three or uh, three or more of these adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And so what that's telling us is that our students were facing traumatic situations and in traumatic circumstances before COVID-19 hit. And so COVID-19 has only exacerbated that trauma. And so in order for us to, as um, educators and in schools and districts across this country, in order for us to minimize the negative impact that all of these, uh, this trauma and these ACEs have placed on our students, there are certain things that we have to do. And one thing that we need to do is pause. Now, when we pause, we pay attention. So this means that we are looking at our students, we're noticing trends in their attendance, we're noticing trends in their behavior with their academics to see if things are changing. You know, were they first coming to class or showing up on Zoom meetings and then now not there, right? Um, were they, uh, did they have stellar behavior and then all of a sudden they're being more aggressive with their peers or even you? we have to pay attention and look for changes in their behavior. Once we notice that they're different, then we need to move in and start asking questions, right? Because when we ask those questions, that will help us to figure out exactly what is beneath the behavior that we're seeing. Once we ask the question, then we use our expertise to determine which other adults do we need to involve in the solution so that we can wrap our arms around these students and get them the support that they need? 
This could be a counselor. This could be another teacher. It could be a principal in the building. It could also even be a parent. And then one that I think is so important is that we need to show genuine interest. What student is going to open up to us if we don't show them that we care and that we have a genuine interest in them and their well-being? When we show that genuine interest, that helps to build trust. And that trust opens our students up to help us to be able to provide them with the support that they need. And then lastly, when we pause, we evaluate the circumstances. So we take all of this information and put it together and we figure out what we can, to do, we can do to support our students. Now, all that pausing, it sounds great, but that's just the beginning. Because when we pause, what we've done is more so for ourselves as an educator and as an adult. We have collected all of the information that we need, but we haven't done anything. And so the next part of this process is for us to react. And when we react, we reach out. So all of those adults that we thought about that we could bring together to help our students, we pull those folks together and we create that team of support so that that student is getting what they need from all the right people and it's not putting a drain on one part of our system. We also extend a helping hand. So we don't say, well, I referred that student to the principal so I can kind of you know, um, pass them along and move on and do the other things that I need to do in my day. No, we want to extend a helping hand by rolling up our sleeves and providing that direct support to our teachers. And then one of the most important parts of REACT is to assume the best. We have to check our mindset. We have to make sure that we understand that our students are giving us the best they, the best that they can under their current circumstances. And as long as we are open to that positive mindset about our students, then we open ourselves up to be able to provide them with a high level of support. Next, we create opportunities for them. These opportunities may, come, uh, may make themselves available inside of our classroom. They may make themselves available inside of our school in the district or even in our broader community. Uh, the more we create opportunities for students and the more we actually give students access to the opportunities that we come into contact with, then the better we will be able to support them. And lastly, we need to tap into their greatness. I don't care what a student is experiencing. I don't care what kind of behavior they are exhibiting. Um, at their core, they are a child, and they have interests as well as strong points, um, and they have strengths. And when we tap into their greatness, what we do is we allow them to feel success and experience success, and that success builds up their confidence, and then they're in a better state of mind and a better state of being to be able to accomplish and complete these rigorous and relevant tasks that we create for them. So if we want to figure out how we can uh, not only provide that tier one level of support that Weston talked about with his 12 habits, how do we get to that level of tier two support with our students? And to do that, we must pause and we must react. And when we pause and react for our students, then we're able to leverage those relationships that we built to them in order to strengthen the connections that we have with them. Now, all this talk about pause and react, it just really brings me right back home to my son, Jeffrey. And Jeffrey, he just turned four a couple of weeks ago. Um, oh, Ty Ann said, oh. <laughs> yep, that's what I say too when I look at him in the morning. And so, you know, Jeffrey's four, he's about to enter our K-12 system sooner than later. And so when he enters into this environment, yes, I want him to be challenged and I want him to be provided with rigorous uh, tasks that's gonna help him to think on a deep level. And I want him to be able to solve authentic and creative problems. And what I also want 
is for Jeffrey to be in an environment where he is seen and where he is cared for. And I really want to make sure that he's in a place where someone will pause and react on his behalf. All right, Vanola, thank you so much. Weston, thank you so much. I'm gonna ask them to make sure they have their videos on and unmuted because uh, we're gonna do a Q&A and, and hopefully one of my other colleagues, uh, Lori or Lauren can uh, read the questions to us. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box, everyone. Um, and we will do our best to answer them. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, Eric, I do want to address, Ty, Ty put a really good question in the uh, chat window about uh, strategies. And the question is, how do these strategies generally grow and evolve based on grade level? So for example, uh, middle school versus high school students. So let me, let me, if you don't mind, speak to uh, those instructional strategies for just a moment. And the answer to your question, Ty, is they do. They evolve over time. And the, the level of cognitive rigor associated with these instructional strategies and evolves over time, and that shows up in the scaffolds that we offer for kids. So say, say we wanna do a, a reciprocal teaching with kids. Uh, reciprocal teaching is a, an instructional strategy, has an effect size greater than seven tenths. Uh, it necessitates anytime kids read anything, they make predictions, they clarify vocabulary words, they ask and answer questions, and they provide an objective summary of a text. So what does that look like for an elementary school child? Well, asking a kid uh, in elementary school to look at a book, uh, look at the title of a book, look at pictures of a book, and just make a prediction, maybe too heavy a cognitive lift. And so what we do is we provide scaffolds for that to say, hey, uh, we are about to read uh, this book, and here are four possible predictions. Which prediction do you think best, uh, uh, best allows us per to predict what will happen in this book? And allow them to choose from a list of four, and then open up a conversation and a dialogue to tell you why. For kids in middle school or high school, you may not need scaffolds and support like that. Uh, think about what comes at the end of a reciprocal teach. It's a summarization of a text. Well, in elementary school, especially for our early elementary ed kiddos, pre-K through two, we know that that's not the skill that comes first. It's retail. And so again, it's about providing, it, I am a firm believer that great teaching is great teaching. And one of the things that I wish all teachers would omit from their teaching vocabulary is the phrase, oh, that works well with these kids, but it wouldn't work well with my kids. Uh, it, that for me is evidence uh, of an individual who is either not capable or not willing of putting forth the cognitive effort into figuring out how does this strategy apply for my kids. And so start to ask yourself, like if you teach youngers, where can you provide scaffolds that lift that strategy up? If you teach older kids, uh, kids who are, are more advanced or proficient, how can you remove scaffolds to increase cognitive rigor? Uh, I'm not sure if anyone has um, anything else to say on that, but th those are those are my two thoughts on. Uh, and and uh, great response. Uh, I was able to pull up the the chat box, so I'll repeat. Uh, I'll state this next question before I do. Um, you, when you go to the link up here, everyone, the leadered.com, contact us. Uh, short questionnaire. You answer it however you want. You'll then get the PDF to this slide deck. Uh, the recording will also go up on all three of our YouTube channels. So we will have that there. And, you know, as we think about a question, here we go. Let me go up. This is from Lori. My teachers are all training this summer on Google Classroom and other extensions. They are rocking it, but they feel out of control, oops, <laughs> out of control and anxious about how the changes, uh, how this changes their pacing classroom experience, student outcomes. How can I help them? You know, I'll take the first stab at this. That's natural. Everyone feels like this. There's so much change. And we want to train on the tool like Google Classroom. But Google Classroom is only as good as what it enables teachers and students to do that they couldn't do before it or without it. So the whole idea is coming back to that sound pedagogy and instructional design, thinking about those, those strategies that Weston shared before, thinking about how we create a safe, nurturing environment that Manola uh, referenced. But the whole piece is pedagogy. When we think about that transition, we think about on Google Classroom, you know, how will kids, how will you know kids are learning? You know, how will you meet all kids' needs regardless of where they are? 
Uh, you know, what is the role of the Google Classroom? Is it a repository of just information or will kids be using it to share work, to access Google Forms, to work on formative and summative assessment? So in order to reassure them, the, the best piece of advice is refer them back to what they're trained on, to what they're comfortable with. Good instruction, what the teacher does, leading to powerful learning, what the kid does. Weston, yeah. if I don't want to jump in, feel free. Just to add to that, um, you know, like even with us in our trainings that have pretty much all gone, gone remote or virtual, you know, we have definitely changed things up a lot. Um, but, you know, for teachers, you know, a measure for them can be, you know, were the standards um, in this lesson or in this task met? If students were able to meet those standards um, or meet those objectives, then the teacher knows that that was a good, that was a good lesson, right? The platform was used well. Um, was there an opportunity to hear more student voice? Because the more we can use these tools uh, to in, uh, increase the level of student voice in the classroom, then that's also another measure of, yes, we got this right. And then the last thing that I would, would add was, how was this used to build community in the classroom? And if we could answer that question with some concrete um, things that happen to build community, then I would say that those teachers are definitely on the right track. Great. Great. Hey, uh, Eric, I wanted to address this question from, uh, it looks like Katura in here. Question is, how can we get the students to engage in lessons when they start to stymie? Uh, how can we do, uh, reduce self-stimulatory behaviors virtually? Uh, the answer to your question is it's really, really hard. There are a bunch of things that we have to consider. Number one is pacing. So pacing in a virtual uh, environment is your best friend. Things have to move quickly. They have to move at a pace that doesn't allow for kids to go and explore all of the knowledge of the human experience that's literally sitting right next to them. Number one, watch your pacing. Number two, in any great blended environment, I always say look for the golden trifecta of blended learning. Are, teachers engage, or are kids engaged with the teacher, with the content, and with one another? And in all likelihood, if one of those things is missing, that's when you get situations where kids start to drift away. They start to engage in those sort of self-stimulatory behaviors. It's because they're not being engaged with the teacher, with content, or with one another. And so they seek engagement elsewhere if they're not receiving it from their learning environment. Great. Next question uh, from Kathy. Suggestions for dealing with our students who have been identified with behavioral and or focus issues, either in person or remotely, uh, seems anxiety levels are powered up. Yeah, I will start that by saying, especially with the students who may have, um, you know, behavior issues, you know, definitely thinking about that pause and react tool and really, you know, asking those questions to figure out exactly what's going on for that student. Um, and then also trying to get to the bottom of what is it that they need to help to curb that behavior. Um, and like Weston said, it may be more interaction with the content. It may be more interaction with the teacher. It may be more interaction with the peers, um, and it also could be, you know, incorporating more of their interests and also helping to highlight some of their strengths uh, during those instructional blocks. So I think that's something that you could think about in terms of students that have behavior as well as focus issues. And I'll just add to the second piece of that when we think about, you know, the anxiety and things, it's finding balance, everybody. I, I, we were all just talking offline of how difficult and tiring the day has been because we're spending it all using technology. So a lot of it comes back to good pedagogy and how you break it up to reduce that anxiety, integrating mindfulness, integrating movement, independent reading, uh, independent practice. There's nothing to do with technology. Weston, I think you had something. Go. Yeah, I, I was just, just going to finish up because I know we're getting close to the end of our time here by saying, Everything that Eric's talking about and Vanola's talking about and that I've talked about today, understand very clearly uh, our, our problems won't be solved by a half hour webinar or a 45 minute webinar. Uh, here's what we know to be true. There were two studies done, one in 1983 and then it was replicated in 2004, where it basically said uh, when teachers are simply exposed to a new skill, much like we're doing now, typically only about 10% of educators can replicate that skill. But I want to make sure that as we leave today, we think about ongoing support for our teachers. If you are a school or district leader out there, it's not enough just to show. Because again, we know that when we just show skills to teachers, only 10% can replicate the skill. But what we know to be true is that when teachers are coached through the awkward phase of implementation, more than 95% can replicate the skill. 
please, please, my last uh, thing that I'll implore of all of you is please make sure coaching isn't the thing that you are thinking about doing. Make sure on behalf of your teachers and our children, it is the thing that you are always doing. We know that it's the game changer and it is the thing that will authentically move our kids forward. And before we end, one question did come in uh, before, you know, or a lot of time, so I'm going to address it. And that was from Francesca about IEPs. Uh, there's a lot of guidance from the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, pretty much, you know, if we're providing any type of remote learning for our general ed population, then the accommodations that are in place in the current IEP have to be honored. The other solution is to, whether it's face-to-face -face or virtually, uh, get the IEP teams to meet, to uh, adapt and evolve, update the IEP that really takes into account some of the things that you're talking about, because all hours are not created equal, everyone. So spend the time to look at the IEP and think about what changes have to be made uh, in order to, uh, for those kids to be successful. Uh, I just want to thank my colleagues, Weston Vanola, so much. If you saw, um, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to keep the content to 30 minutes. And we tried some things new. You know, if you saw the hand waving, that was basically for Weston and Vanola to tell me and made me pay attention to do the slides. We set our timers. We worked really, really hard because we feel that, you know what, we wanna give you some content, we wanted to give you some time to ask questions, but we also wanna give you some time to reflect. And please, you could use the hashtag that's at the bottom of the screen, Leader Ed, you can post that to Twitter anytime, uh, post to our Twitter handles, we will answer you. But we also wanna say that we're here to help everybody. And if, if you go to that contact link, you know, myself, Weston, and Vanola, you know, we came together, we wanted to do this, but we have a team behind us, everybody. We have a team that's focusing on every single aspect of how we improve teaching, learning, and leadership. And we would love to have a conversation. You can have a conversation with me, with Weston, with Vanola, or one of our team members, just a conversation about where you are, but more importantly, where do you want to be? And that was the point here. We don't have all the answers, everybody. No one does. But we are here to help you, whether it's through a webinar like this or more intensive hybrid model, job embedded, ongoing professional learning. Thank you for your time. Thank you for what you do for kids. Thank you for showing that education is the best profession in the world. And stay safe, everyone. That's right. Have a great night, guys. Be well, everybody.